Here we go. Here we go. At our church, Jesus is Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts, and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all, it's His, and we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church. Today we are going to be in Galatians 1, chapter 3, I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 1, verses 3 through 12. It says this, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to prevent the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel, other than what you have accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I not now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. You know, today, a couple weeks ago, um, actually it was about a month ago now, I preached on the walking dead. That was what I talked about. And one thing that I talked about in there was social media. Okay? Now, before I say anything else, I'm going to say what I said then, just so if you weren't there, you hear it. Social media is not always 100% of the time bad. Okay? But it's 99.9%. So the um, reason why I say that is because um, there's stories, um, not necessarily in the national news, but there's like if you've ever gone to like Vox or E! News, hopefully you have no idea what that is. God, I pray you have no idea what that is. Um, but some of the things that they put on there are crazy stuff. Okay, It's not just there. It's everywhere. But, uh, and, and some of it kind of floods over into Twitter. Okay, and Facebook and Instagram and, you know, Instagram's coming out with IGTV now, like YouTube and all this other stuff going on. But nevertheless, one thing that is, that transcends the topic is everybody's got an opinion on it. Everybody thinks they know best, right? Everybody thinks that they, you don't know what you're talking about, but me, you wish you were me, right? That's what everybody seems to think. And so 
I want to talk about that a little bit today and evolve it for us going forward because I do think it's such a big issue, and I think that because everyone has an opinion, some people believe others' opinions about certain things. And so with this, what it's telling us in our spiritual perspective, which is the way that we need to look at our lives, really, and in general, is it's telling you people have opinions on God. I'm summarizing what I just read, by the way. People have opinions on God, but if anybody preaches to you a different gospel than what's here, you need to rethink it. You need to put your own thoughts into it. You need to know what this says. Now, I challenge you to take everything, and I'm sure Pastor Rama would agree with me, take everything that he and I say from the pulpit up here and analyze it, please, because both of us make mistakes. There are some times where we will make a mistake, especially up here, okay? But that's your job as people out there, okay, to, to analyze that, to think it, because don't just take what we say. Don't just take what, what, what we're saying up here as, as gospel. Feel free. Look at it. Know it, right? Because that's what God has called each of us to do. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a, a college graduate. You don't have to be any of that. But just read. Get to know him and have a relationship. And so that's what this summarizing here of the, of the gospel, or I'm sorry, of Galatians and what it's saying about the gospel of Christ. And that's where it's so important because we are so quick when we log on to social media, right? I know people who spend like 12, 15 hours a day on this stuff, right? And so when they get on there and they see something and instantly they're like, yes, yes. They don't put any thought into it. They don't think about it. Just instantly, yes, that's right. Now I have to, now I have to post what I think about it because i got to echo what they said because people really care. Um, and so what this is telling you, and, and I want to focus on, I've read the whole thing because it's important for con contextual purposes, but I really want to talk about verse 10 where he says, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. My job up here, when I preach to you every, uh, when I preach to you every Sunday that I'm up here, um, is to put things in a, in a perspective for you. So that's what I'm going to do today. And it's a little challenging, but, but hopefully we'll be able to go through it together. How many of you ha know or have ever seen videos of lions and hyenas? How many of you have ever seen videos like that, right? How many of you root for the hyenas? Anybody? Oh, good. Okay, good. Good, good, good. Okay, so good. So none of you are going to be upset. Well, I happen to like uh, National Geographic, Nat Geo, right? Like you see some things on there. And it's crazy, right? I don't actually watch the channel, but I go on YouTube and watch like the little clips. I saw a clip a while back. It's actually a couple years old. So there's a pride of lions, and they just got, I don't know, gazelle or zebra or something. And, they're, you know, the c camera guy's filming them, okay? And he's got the camera on it. Then all of a sudden, he, he kind of turns around. And he looks, and there's hyenas off in a distance, all right, and they're laughing, right, and they're, <laughs> and they're, you know, like talking to each other, and they're having a good old time, and they start, like, looking, right, like, what's he got there? Has he got food for us? What's he doing, right? And then they come up closer, they come up closer and closer and closer, and eventually, one of the hyenas makes a very bad mistake, and he goes after a lioness, okay, female lion, big mistake. You never mess with lion's food, and you never mess with his woman. Those are two things you never want to do. So he thought, the hyena thought it was going to be a good idea. So what happens is you can kind of probably guess what's going to happen, but the female lion runs after the hyena, chases him away, and the camera guy's watching. So it's kind of zoomed in. You can't see what's going on around it. All of a sudden, the female lion stops for about a second, and then you see the male lion coming up, and he's running, and he's running, Hyena didn't stand a chance, okay? The hyena got tackled, one bite, done, over with. Lion goes back to his day. Lion, lion goes back to his wife, right? And that's that. Game over. You see, because the hyenas don't have a chance against a full-grown male lion. A healthy male lion, hyena has zero chance. 
But the hyena mentality, I think, is something that we all can relate to. What do I mean? Well, we stand off in the distance, and we comment, right? I picture it like this. Obviously, we don't know what they're saying. But I picture it like this. Like, the hyenas go up to the lion, right, and they're chattering, and they say, you got that zebra. He's small. You could have done better than that, right? You think that's going to feed everybody? What's, you're weak. Who do you think you are? You're not better than us. Are you kidding me? There's six of us, and, like, one of you. You're nothing to us, right? That's kind of what I picture it as. Because the hyenas are just that kind of way, right? They don't want to really do anything on their own. They would much rather steal from the lion because it's easier, right? And they get a, you know, they get a kick out of it, I think. But to relate it to us today, everybody has the hyena mentality of they want to talk. They want to chatter. They want to give their opinion. They, want to, they just want to be heard, right? They, they want their voices to be heard because, well, because people care, sort of, or they think they do. And so the dynamic of the hyenas and the lions we're going to get to later, but the hyenas specifically, if we look, and as I go forward, and I'm going to give a couple examples here, but as I go forward, pick, think about your life and try to picture what I'm saying and think if there's any specific aspect in your life where you do have this hyena mentality, this mentality of, well, you're good, but you're not as good as me or not as good as us, or you're, you're okay, but you're really not that great, honestly, in the grand scheme of things, right? We hear that all the time. And so the first thing, the first thing to ask yourself is, do you like to show off? Right? Because a hyena loves to show off, right? The hyena mentality, they love it. They love to kind of overpower the lion. They try to go there and they try to, you know, think they're big and bad and they show up in numbers and they talk and you know, lions get ticked off with that pretty easily. But the first thing is the hyenas, they love to show off. So the first scripture comes from Matthew. You see it up there. It's in red. Jesus said it. Matthew 6, 1 through 4 in the English Standard. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So that, you may, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. Why? Because when we do show off, we show off for ourselves, right? We show off to make ourselves look good. When in reality, basically what Jesus is trying to say here is, don't show off because A, you're not going to get a reward, and B, none of this stuff is coming from you anyway. Everything that we have is not ours, or I should say everything that we quote-unquote have is not ours. It's his, and it's the things that he's given us to help others and to do his will and to give him the glory. In Luke 14, 11, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. In other words, you want to humble yourself because you don't want God to do it. Who has been humbled by God before in some way or another? Every hand should be up, right? Because we do fall into that trap. And there's one thing about a show-off, and that's they have pride, right? And so pride is a very dangerous thing. The Bible says that pride comes before fall, right? We've all heard that. And it's very true. Why? Because you take your, your eyes off of God and you, put your, you, you look into the mirror. You put your eyes on yourself, right? Because you're not looking at God anymore, you somehow think that you're you and the world revolves around you, right? And so just wrapping up in Luke 14, 11, those who are humble, God will exalt. God will raise up. God will call and do great things with. But humility has to come first so that there's room for God in your life. 1 Corinthians 1, 28, 31 says, in the NIV, says, God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things 
and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become, who has become for us wisdom of God, wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Summary, you can read it for yourself, but I think what this is trying to say is if you are one of those people who has to, to boast, and there's people like that out there, okay? If you're one of those people, don't boast in yourself. Boast in him, right? If you think about it, a good example of this was the Mother's Day panel forum uh, talk up here that we had, whatever you want to call it. And the thing about that was, you know, how, the, how they talked. And they shared their stories, but they also shared in those stories how God has helped them, how God has been for them, how God has seen them through, right? And that is what Christ is talking about. He's not necessarily talking about, um, you know, well, go around and say, you know, that, that, that Jesus is the way, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But it's more to it than just that. It's, it's something to say that you're giving your story, that you're saying, hey, you know, I've been there, right, and this is how God saw me through. Or, I did this, and this happened, and God saw me through, or this happened, or whatever. But the fact is that we are not glorified. It's our quote-unquote story. But more importantly, it's God's, it's the story of God working in us and through us on how we can exalt him and 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 Carmen saying to God be the glory, right? Great things he has done. So love to the world that he gave us his son, right? And so because of that, because of him giving his son, he is due all the glory, not us. He's due all the glory because of who he is and what he's done. The second thing that a hyena does in a, in a hyena mentality, I'm going to call it, is they can't tame their tongue, right? The tongue is a very hard thing to stop. And what is it? We, we know from, you know what this is saying, basically, is that is our talk, our speech, what we say. And sometimes what we don't say is just as bad as what we do say but shouldn't say, right? So that's the one thing that, that, that really stuck out to me. And I want to go into scriptures in a second, but gossip, right? Who loves their soap operas? Not me, I don't. But there's some people out there who love soap operas. Why? Because it's gossip, right? They, they go to one, and it's two characters, and they're talking about two other characters, and then they go off the screen, and they go to the two other characters, and then they're talking about the first two, and it's crazy. But, but we, as Christians, sometimes gossip about each other, right? We sometimes gossip about each other like, did you hear? No, I didn't hear what happened. Did you hear what they did? No, I didn't hear. Tell me, right? We're very inviting into that dynamic. We're very inviting into it, and we entertain it. And it's very hard, again, for us to tame our tongue. If our tongues are tame, we'll scooch out of that and say, you know what? Got to go. Don't want to talk about that, whatever. But James 3, 9 through 12. With the tongue who we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. How many of you have heard the saying, do you kiss your mother with that mouth? How many of you have heard that saying before, right? Okay. I got a new saying for you. All right. I haven't heard this anywhere. I thought about it. Okay. It was, I'm, I'm convinced it was from God because there's no way I thought it was on my own. So rather than to say, do you kiss your mother with that mouth, say, do you praise your God with that mouth? Right? Some of the things, if we analyze the things that we say, and we ask ourselves that question, am I going to say this and then go 
praise God, pray to God, talk to God, or whatever you like to call it. Do we, is it contradicting the scripture? Do we do have that salt and fresh water coming from our mouths? Do we, do we talk like that? What kind of talk, and, and not just physical talk, but social media, text message, email, yada, 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 whatever. But what kind of talk are we engaging in? In Ephesians 4.29, it says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now, it's not necessarily this unwholesome talk, okay? That, that's a wide variety of things. It doesn't necessarily mean that you've got to be all, you know, just all high in the cloud, or pie in the sky, as they call it, or, you know, you don't have to be all like that. Sometimes constructive criticism is a good thing, right? But there's ways to do that. I think that's probably a small portion, but it's there nonetheless. But if not, if you're not feeling that, if you don't know what to say, just move on, right? Just move on. Just don't worry about it. God knows. He doesn't need you to go and just tell that person anything because he knows, right? How many times has God talked to us and called us out on things? I think a lot of the time God does that. Going back to my script, uh, sermon last week and the scriptures that I shared, if God's not challenging you in these kind of ways, question things. Try to get closer to him. Try to know him more and go on a deeper level with him because he can help you in these departments. Matthew 5.11. What goes into someone's mouth, this is Jesus talking, does not defile them. But what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Jesus is telling you, what you're saying is harming you. Right? What you're saying is harming you. And there's been studies, I don't, I don't have them in front of me because I just thought about this, but there's been studies where people with positive attitudes perform better on every major category. Every major category, right? There's really no explanation for it, but they just do. Why? Because the talk that's coming out of their mouth is positive. The talk that's coming out of their mouth isn't some pie in the sky thing, but it's positive. It's things that can happen. It's, well, you know, I don't know what God's doing, but he's doing something, right? Not claiming to know anything, but, but diverting it to God and letting him take control. So, t- take what I just said and think in your life about that hyena mentality. Because I don't want any of us to be like hyenas. I want all of us to be lions, Lions in Scripture are used for many, many, many different things. But there's one thing that all those things have in common, right? From, let's take the lion's den, okay? From the lion's den to Jesus being the lion of the tribe of Judah, which we're going to talk about in a couple minutes, that, those two things are very different on the surface. But the one underlying thing is they represent power, right? When, David walked, or when Daniel excuse me, walked out of the lion's den... That was a powerful moment. Why? Because they didn't kill him. They could have very easily killed him, but they didn't because Daniel's God was there. Right? So these things, the lions are very powerful just by biblical definition. So we're going to talk a couple things. I talked about the hyenas. Now it's the lion's turn and a couple of traits that the lions have and a couple things that they know and why they do what they do. The first thing that a lion knows is that time is short. Steve Jobs gave a commencement, if you don't know who Steve Jobs is, he was the creator, co-founder, excuse me, of Apple computers. The iPhones you use, yeah, he's the guy that thought of that. So uh, he passed away in 2011, but in 2005 he gave a commencement, I believe it was at Stanford. And one of the lines from that is, Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living by the result of other people's thinking. Don't listen to other people. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. I would only change one line in that, and that's the last one. And most important, have the courage to follow Christ. Right? Have the courage to do what he has called you to do because time is short, right? Don't listen to what other people are telling you. Don't listen to what the hyenas in your life 
are telling you can and can't be done because it's not decided by them. It's decided by him. Genesis 2, 16 through 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat of any tree in the garden, but you must not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. It's inevitable. It's been inevitable from the beginning. We all have that expiration date. Okay, we all do. So it's important for us to really understand this, and that's not an easy or fun thing to talk about, but we have to understand it. We have to know it. Why? Because if we go around thinking, well, I'm going to be on this earth forever, so I can just, I can go have some fun, right? I can go do all kinds of things because God will be there. Yeah, God will be there, but you never know, right? So time is very short. Hebrews 9, 27 in the King James. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. I want to focus on the beginning part of that, but just the judgment side note here. So if you are a follower of Christ, you do not face the heaven slash hell judgment. You don't face that, right? You, you, you're going to be there, but you're not in jeopardy. Let's put it that way. But there is a second judgment that the Bible talks about, which I'm not going to get into in, in, in too much because it's a sermon topic of its own. But the second judgment is based on what we've done. And there's crowns involved in that judgment, and we place the crowns at Christ's feet. That's what the Bible says in Revelation. So because of that, it is important what we do. It is important who we help, how we live, who, what we say especially, and, and who we involve ourselves with, right? That's what is very important for us to remember, that that judgment is there. So, just a sidebar there. But the first part of 27 is, as it is appointed unto men once to die. Again, it's inevitable. It's appointed to us from the day that we're conceived. It's just going to happen, right? And we need to make sure that at the end of, all, at the end of it all, that we are able to say that we did have that lion mentality. So, yeah, have the lion mentality, but how do you become a lion? Or how, how do you get that lion mentality? Well, in 1 Corinthians 28, 20, David also said to Solomon, his son, be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work of the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. For today's purposes, he will not fail you or forsake you until all the work of and for the work for the service of your life is finished. In other words, he's with you till the end. If we remember that in our lives through our daily day-to-day -day struggles and the overall life struggles, if we remember that, and I talked about this in a couple of messages before, it can allow us to do great things, and especially in this one, becoming a lion. Know that you've got, that God's got your back. Let's put it that way. Know that he is there for you. Know that he is watching over you, and he is protecting you, and he will not fail you. 2 Timothy 1.7, for the Spirit of God for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Self-discipline we talked about last week, but power is there, right? It gives us power to accomplish what Christ has given us to do in this life. As long as we are plugged into him and we just saying there's power in the name of Jesus, right? We have to plug into that power, though. We have to we have to, you know, if you have a light, it's no good unless you plug it into an outlet. Or if you're like me, when you lose power on a Sunday morning and everything goes off, that's definitely not good. Um, that happened to me this morning. But um, without power, it's no good. The appliances are useless. But that's why it's important for us to be plugged in. Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Be strong. There it is again. Strength is mentioned in power. is mentioned an awful lot in the Bible. But take heart. In other words, remember, take heart, remember this, put this in your heart as you go throughout your day-to-day -day life. Philippians 1, 28 from the NIV, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you, hyenas, this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but you, but that you will be saved, and that by God. Remember that those people in your life who are targeting you, those people who say things about you, remember 
God's got that. God's got it. You don't have to talk about them. You don't have to say a word about them. Trust me, he knows, okay? And he is handling it. But remember that you are saved. You are saved by God. Nothing that you did, but what he did. And Christ is a lion, and we should learn from him. Remember that he is a lion, and we're going to talk about that. You can see there in the Revelation Scripture, but John 16, 33, first of all, it says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus had hyenas, right? Jesus had hyenas. Well, how? What were they? They were the people that were gambling for his stuff. They were the people at the cross that were taunting him, mocking him. They were those people who were there flogging him. They were those people who nailed him to the cross. They were those people who, who, who were screaming and hollering at him, if you've ever seen the movies, right? Well, they were really loud, right? They were loud. And I'm sure on Friday, and Saturday, Friday night and Saturday, I'm sure they were having a good time. The problem was that Sunday morning came right? Sunday morning came, and all that chatter, all that laughter, all that fun stopped. Why? Because he rose again. Because he overcame. Those, those, those hyenas, those people that were talking about him, didn't matter one bit. The ending, the outcome, is the same. And just one other note. I, I gave a scripture in Genesis and Adam and Eve had it too, right? Satan, when they came to tempt Adam and Eve, when they came to tempt them, when, when Satan came to tempt them, well, don't worry. You deserve it. Just do it, right? It's okay. Listen, God doesn't know what he's talking about. Just do it. You, you want that, don't you? You can do it, right? Sounds a lot like we, what we face today, doesn't it? Right? But that's what, that's, everybody has had this. Adam and Eve, Jesus, everybody everybody has had a few hyenas now and again it's just important that we're not the hyenas right revelation 5 2 through 5 and i saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals and no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it then i began to weep greatly because no one was found to be to be worthy to open the book or to look into it. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and the seven seals. You see, Jesus is a lion, not in the physical sense that we might think about it. Jesus is overcome. Jesus is the definition of power and might. Jesus is the Savior of the world, and he saves us each and every day. I told you that last week about my puppy, all right, and I'm not going to share anything about him today, but I'm just going to say, you know, his name is Mufasa, so it's only appropriate that I like the Lion King. So there is a portion of the Lion King that overlaps our, this, this message almost so perfectly, it's incredible. So I'm going to share this clip, but before I do, just a little overview, right? So Simba... Mufasa's son, the, the future Lion King. This is from the first one, not the second one. Um, but, Muf uh, but Simba and his girlfriend go out, and they get trapped with some hyenas out there. And we're going to watch the exchange and watch what happens. Slobbering, mangy, stupid poachers. It's day on the Oopid's day. What do you call it, Oopid's day? My, my, my. Oh, look at the sun. It's time to go. What's the hurry? We'd love you to stick around for dinner. Yeah, we could have whatever's lying around. Oh, wait, 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 I got one, I got one. Make mine a cub sandwich. What you think? <laughs> <laughs> what? what? And what is it? Hey, <laughs> did we order this dinner to go? No. Why? Because there it goes! <laughs> oh! Did we lose him? I think so. Where's Zazu? Ah! The little major domo bird hippity hop all the way to the birdie boiler. Oh no, not the birdie boiler! <laughs> hey, why don't you pick on somebody your own size? Like 
you. Oops. <laughs> If you ever come near my son again. Oh, this is this is your son. Oh, yours. Oh, <laughs> did you know that? No, me. I, I didn't know. No, did you? No, of course not. No. Ed. <laughs> Doodles. Here's the reason why I think that's perfect. Simba engages them. Simba listens to them. He talks back to them. Made the same mistake Adam and Eve did, right? He lets them talk, and he says, yeah, but, yeah, but I'm the, I'm Simba, right? You know me, right? He, he does engage them, and, well, gets himself in a little bit of trouble. And even when he's in trouble, he still engages them. Well, what happens? His dad comes, Mufasa comes, and he saves the day. Now, what's the first thing that he says? Silence. He doesn't want to hear it. He doesn't want to talk to them. He just wants them silent, and he gives them the warning. Never come near my son again. How many times has God done that for us? How many times has God stepped in in those moments where we're trapped, and we're somewhat, I, I just don't know why we do it, but sometimes we still engage. We still talk. You know, we let out that little roar, and then Dad has to come in and save us, Right? How many times does that happen? I would reckon to say it happens a lot. But the important thing is that we recognize it, that we know it. And I cut it off there just because after that, it was a little longer clip than I wanted to use. But Mufasa scolds him, right? And says, don't, don't do that again, right? That's basically what he says, to protect him. And then you see Scar, the lion that's, that winds up, you know, killing Mufasa at the end, is... It's kind of like looking over them and watching and seeing what's going on. The enemy is always around. The enemy is always lurking. But it's important for us to have that mentality of alliance so that we don't get in those messes because the accomplishments that we can achieve when we are at our best and God is on our side, we are unstoppable. Be not because of anything that we did, but because of what he did and who he is. Let us pray. Dear Lord, today, would you give us the heart of a lion? Would you help us to not be timid or fearful, but know the power that is behind us and you, that there is power indeed in the name of Jesus? Would you watch over us this day? Would you protect us as a good father always does because you care for us so deeply? Bless us through the rest of the service and help this message to touch our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's a few reasons why people don't go to church. I can't come to church until I get my life together. Church is how I got my life together. Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And there's always room for one more. All they care about is your money. They care about me, not about my money. Is there some kind of dress code? Yes, the code is wear some clothes. Church, it just makes me nervous. I was nervous at first, 
and then I felt right at home. I'm not sure I believe everything that you believe. But you can still belong. Church is for wimpy, girly men. You want to say that again? If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't want me. If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't be worried. You can come to my church even if you were brought up Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Mormon, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Southern Baptist. A little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. See, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. So please, come to my church. Where nobody's perfect. Where beginners are welcome. Where socks are optional. But grace is required. Where forgiveness is offered. Where hope is alive. And where it's okay to not be okay. Really.